So I, I want to talk a little bit about, about China because China's yeah. kind of uh, an, an interesting case because where is it in the economic freedom index? It's, it must be very low. Yeah, it is low. It's obviously, we, we, I don't have a score for, for Mao's China. Mao's China on a scale of 10 would have been a one, I mean, a 0.5 or something. Uh, in our scale right now, they're like five and a half or six uh, on the 10 point scale. Their ranking is like 110th out of 160. It's by no means, and, 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 and certainly parts of China like Shenzhen are probably as economically free as, as say Hong Kong even. But uh, as a whole, China doesn't score very well. It's still a very tightly government controlled economy. The capital markets are completely government controlled banking system. Um, they have an authorized private property, but you know, it, it's a still a, what capitalism exists in China is crony capitalism and it's be, crony capitalism is better than socialism, but, uh, and we should give in, in China some credit I, for that. Yeah. But, I hate but, the term crony capitalism. Just uh, to, uh, I know. Yeah, I, I, I do too, actually. Um, so, so they don't score very well. Um, um, but, so uh, you explain, know, how do we expel the wealth creation? Because that's always yeah. kind of a, a mystery. We always say there's a high correlation between economic yeah. freedom and wealth creation. And China seems, I don't think really does, seems to contradict that because we've seen massive amounts of wealth creation. But by conventional measures, at least, there's no economic freedom there. Well, I mean, so for, I mean, for one thing, I think when it comes to growth and, and China's grown from, let's say, $1,000 per person to maybe eight, ten thousand dollars per person or something like that. That's an incredible growth rate to go. That's a, you know, a tenfold increase in incomes. And we know it's just lifted, you know, literally hundreds of millions of people out of abject poverty into something like a dignified life. It's a great yep. thing. Um, uh, and that's what you get if you just let off the, the, the you know, l take your foot off the neck of people just a little bit. They will they will rise up and, and prosper all by themselves. So I think a lot of it is just getting out of Mao's hard socialism to something like what we see today is enough to get you a lot of progress. Now, I don't think China is going to go from 10,000 or wherever it is today to thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 per person, like the kind of standards of living that we enjoy in the U.S. or in Europe. That's going to require actual something more like real capitalism. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just, just not actually trying to, to keep people down is all it takes. And so I, I think that's the first thing. And the other thing is, you know, the parts of China that are growing the most are the ones that that have liberalized the most. And so the growth hasn't been uniform. It's been concentrated in those special economic zones and the cities where, where that has happened. And, and, the, and those places are approaching, you know, the liberalness of, of Europe or the U.S. From an economic, not in every, yeah, from an economic perspective. And we, well, we know that's not, not true across the board, though. Yeah, and you know, I think that's important because it, it is the growth in the Shenzhen and Shanghai and place like that. that because I've been in rural China, and rural China is still unbelievably poor, and and it's still kind of sad. But it's also empty of people because so many people have left. And these cities, I remember the first time I was in Dongguan, I think in two thousand four or five. It, it, Dongguan, there was nobody there in eighty five, eighty six, and now it's got in two thousand four, it had eight to ten million people already. I mean, it's, and it's in, it's in close to Shenzhen. It's in that Guangzhou area where, where it's relatively free. That's where the economic progress has, has, has really happened. And one of the reasons I, you know, people on the right, that term I hate, but people on the more conservative conventional right, afraid of China, right? Because China's going to get rich. It's going to become richer than America. And it's going to have this army and it's going to conquer the world. And my view is, as long as they stay authoritarian, they can't get to the 30, 40,000 per capita. And that's what rich means. And if they free up, then who cares if they become rich? Then it's a win-win for everybody if they actually free up. So the correlation between freedom and, and prosperity still has not been uh, broken. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no question about it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, China's uh, political system is still uh, hotly, uh, you know, repressive. And, and you and I, I think you especially found that out firsthand. We attended the, a meeting with you in, yep. in Beijing. Ben and I were there for our book. And frankly, no offense, we didn't want to spend the entire time with you guys. No, so no. We, we just dropped in at the, af at the end of it one day uh, for this just delightful little conference that you, you helped organize with the Unirol Institute, I think, yep. uh, on Ayn Rand and Hayek. And it was just it was a wonderful thing to be in Beijing with Chinese scholars and, and talking about the ideas of Rand and Hayek. And well, of course, you know, 
I think per- firsthand what happened the next morning when the government shut the meeting down and we had already left, but we um, actually, what actually happened is we had moved. So we were supposed to hold a meeting at a university and the, you know, at, at um, the university where many of the scholars came from and the university called a call that that day saying, you cannot do it at the university. And they, they, they shut it down at the university. And they said, the scholars are not allowed to attend, even if you do it elsewhere. So we actually moved the event to a hotel. And, the, and some of the scholars, I mean, these are, I mean, one of the things that's really sad about China is these scholars that you've met, I've met, they're courageous people. I mean, these, I mean we, we have it easy, right? We, we, we combat students and other professors in our universities. These people have secret service people following them around and watching them, and they could go to jail at any moment. Some of them uh, have sat in jail uh, on, on several occasions and are being interrogated by the by, by the police there. So it's, it's, it's really a, a horrible situation they live under. But many of them came to the event in spite of that. At the same time as we ran the event at the hotel, the officers of Unirol where there was, were, were, were attacked and a bunch of thugs that were hired by governments uh, shut them down. And since then, I don't know if you saw in the New York Times a few weeks ago, uh, there was a story that they've shut down the institute. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Completely out of business and you know, it's so sad because these people, I, I, many of them years ago, two years ago, they were already a little pessimistic, but I'd say five, six years ago, they were so optimistic about the direction China was going to head in politically, not just economically. And it's, it's tragic to see, to see really what happened there and what's going on there. Um, so, yeah, it, it, you know, I don't think China is going to get much richer unless it opens up, frees up and, and, and changes course. And I, unfortunately, I don't see that happening anytime yeah. soon. I mean, sometimes scholars call this the middle income trap. I mean, you, you can get to middle income reason, just, you know, basically just let some markets work. You'll get the middle income just, you know, on autopilot. But you want to get to actual, you know, the innovation economies that we, we, we live in. That, that requires actual economic freedom. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm willing to applaud countries, you know, getting to middle income. That's, that's good for those people, but Absolutely. it's not going to happen. And even we don't have real economic freedom. So you can imagine yeah. how rich we would be Absolutely. and the kind of innovation and technology we would have if we had real economic, uh, economic What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually... uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, If you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, Those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...